Right here, we got one, got one. You got one? Yeah, yeah, look at this. All right, Dr. Okada, move in for the catch. A thick cloud of lore has hung for centuries over the densely forested mountains of Japan. Stories that spoke of creatures living and lurking within the shadows of the trees and deep beneath its flowing rivers. Yet as is often the case with lore and its tendency to be passed from storyteller to storyteller, the truth behind the tale is often skewed and quite frequently misunderstood. The Tatori Prefecture proudly hails as being one of the most remote stretches of wilderness in all of Japan. Breathtaking is the beauty that defines this wild place, and we are honored to step foot on these sacred grounds. Today, the Brave Wilderness team and I will be breaking trail for an adventure unlike any we have embarked upon before, as we join the world's leading authority in Japanese giant salamander research and conservation, Dr. Sumio Okada, also known as Okada Sensei. For over two decades, Okada Sensei has been tirelessly working to protect these fragile amphibians, whose breeding grounds are under the constant threat of habitat degradation due to the building of dams and embankment protection walls. The Japanese giant salamander is the second largest amphibian in the world and is considered a living fossil, as their biology has barely changed in millions of years. This, along with their cryptic nature, has shrouded them in a cloak of mystery, and you will soon understand why they have been revered as river dragons. Wow, you can feel the energy in the air within this forest. It is ancient, and the animals that live here, these Japanese giant salamanders, are about as prehistoric as it gets. I'll tell you what, guys, the salamanders are out there. So as we get closer to sunset, we're gonna gear up and head out at night. As you know, these amphibians are nocturnal, so our best chance of coming across them will be under the cover of darkness. Finding river dragons is not impossible under the light of day, yet it's their nocturnal feeding habits that make them much more likely to emerge from their dens at night. All right, guys, well, this is the spot. Dr. Okada says this is where we're getting into the river. We're gonna head upstream and hopefully find some giant salamanders. All right, lead the way. With Okada Sensei leading us forward, the glow of our flashlight beams cut through the darkness and the search for salamanders was underway. In nearly every episode featured on the Brave Wilderness channel, I have been the one who is expected to safely catch our target species. Yet with the giant salamander, that will not be the case. Due to their vulnerable status and cultural importance to the Japanese people, these amphibians are considered a special national monument by the Japanese government. Strict laws and licensing means only Okada Sensei and other licensed researchers are able to catch and handle giant salamanders in the wild. My job will be to spot and assist in recording data if one is found. I'll tell you what guys, you wander away from the rest of the group and just spread out by yourself searching and I just can imagine what it would be like hundreds of years ago to come across one of these creatures for the first time. You could certainly see where all the lore and the myth would have come from. These incredible, enormous river dragons just out here in the darkness hunting amongst the current. Ah, it's exciting to be out here and hopefully we're gonna find a big one. Even with waders keeping our clothes dry, the chill of the water was enough to send consistent shivers down our spines. Yet the thrill of the search and the hope of encountering a true giant kept us all fighting forward. Then suddenly, as if manifested from silt and shadow, there in the ripple of broken fragments of light, the silhouette of a dragon materialized. Wait, 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 right here. Right here, we got one, got one. You got one? Yeah, yeah, look at this. Yeah, okay. Look at that perfect ambush behavior right there just waiting down current with its head pointed in towards the middle of the river. Now, if a fish or a crab comes by, it's capable of just gulping it straight down into its gullet. Now, if I can take just a minute before we catch it, what I wanna do is actually just slink down in the water here with the GoPro on a little light. Let's go ahead and 
drop those lights down lower. Is that okay for your camera? Yeah, okay, let's try that. And I wanna see if I can get some shots of it just naturally right there in its environment. Oh, this is great. All right, it's just holding its ground right now. It definitely can sense that we are here. And I'm able to get right up close to it. Oh, that is so cool. Wow. That's a good one. That is a good sized salamander. What an ancient looking creature. All right, Dr. Okada, move in for the catch. Yes. Man, I got a pretty awesome shot right there. You got it? Whoa. Got it. Man, nice. they could be quick. Wow, look at that. Completely fills the inside of the net. Each salamander is unique and we have to collect the biometric data for every one that we find. So let's get it up here on shore and uh, sure. get what we need. All right guys, now before we collect the biometric data of the salamander, what I wanna do, because this one is so big, is place it inside of this container so we can take an up close look at its really cool features. Now, this will allow you guys to get a better look and of course, us the opportunity to admire it. All right, let's go ahead and get the salamander in there. Oh, this is gonna be cool. You guys got good shots? Yep. Here we go. Wow. The Japanese giant salamander. Have you ever seen an amphibian of that size? It's so big, it almost doesn't fit in the container. Now, notice the shape of the salamander's head. It's wedge-shaped, it's big, it's flat. That allows them to cut through the current and certainly wedge themselves underneath rocks where, of course, they build their dens. And what's very distinct about this salamander as compared to the hellbender is look at all these fleshy little nodules on the head. We didn't see that with the hellbender. And I'm guessing, and Dr. Okada, correct me if I'm wrong, those are sensory organs, right? Mm -hmm. To help them feel around in their environment, sense chemicals, because as you can see, they have very small eyes, very poor eyesight. So they primarily rely on their chemical receptors to help them navigate their environment. Now, as you move your way down the length of the amphibian's body, you'll notice these flaps of skin, right? It looks very wrinkly. Those flaps are actually capable of helping them exchange gases within the water. Basically, this is a way for them to breathe when they're completely submerged. As we know, a lot of amphibians absorb their environment or absorb oxygen in through their skin, and the Japanese giant salamander is a perfect example of an amphibian that uses its skin to breathe. Now, you notice the length between the front legs and the rear legs has quite a noticeable spread, right? That allows them to keep their body really low and squat to the basin of the river. Now, each one of these arms, and of course the legs are very short and stumpy, but they are armed with little pads on their fingertips. They have four fingers up front, five fingers in the back, and those little nuptial pads, they're almost peach in coloration, allow them to grip to the basin of the river. Dr. Okada, can we take a look at the salamander's toes. Let's show those little nuptial pads, maybe on the back foot here. If you can just sort of lean that foot up for Mario's camera there. See if we can look at those pads. You guys see that? Go ahead and zoom oh, yeah. in there. Now you'll notice that the feet are not really webbed like a frog, right? There's a little bit of webbing, it looks like, at the just where the toes connect to the foot. But those pads are really what they rely on to help them move through the environment. They can pretty much lock in place no matter how powerful the current. I noticed that there's like a little divot, a couple divots in the tail. Is that where it's maybe something tried to eat it or bite it? Yeah, bit it. Mm -hmm. uh, something hit the stone. Okay, so maybe a, a potential predator bit at this. Of course, males will also fight with each other to protect breeding territories. Or of course, as we know, the male Japanese giant salamander is oftentimes considered the den master. They look after the eggs and after the larva. So, of course, this salamander would be defending its young if something tried to come in and consume the babies. Now, what's really cool is that when we walked up on the salamander, it was in the process of hunting. And to me, that's one of the most impressive features of this creature is the fact that it will lay in wait in an ambush position and then they have that enormous mouth. It, their jaws spread all the way far back so they can just gulp something up straight out of the water, whether it's a crayfish or a crab, a frog, or sometimes they will even eat other salamanders. So in a sense, this amphibian can be cannibalistic. If it's a smaller Japanese giant salamander, it stands the chance of becoming a meal. 
All right, well, I would say at this point, we're probably ready to collect the biometric data. Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna bring in the measuring tube here. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Okada is going to pick the salamander up. We're gonna put it in there and collect this important research. The same protocol is followed for each and every salamander. As the length is carefully recorded, the weight is accurately checked, and the slippery amphibian is scanned to determine whether or not it was previously tagged. This gentle giant was already in the record books, so its biometrics will be updated, and the good news is that it appears healthy and happy. Further confirmation that this remote population, for now, is continuing to thrive. Well, we have collected all the necessary biometric data and it is time to release the salamander back into the wild. Dr. Okada, thank you so much for leading this expedition tonight. How awesome was this, guys? Heading into the back country of Japan to get up close with the one and only Japanese giant salamander. I'm Coyote Peterson, be brave, stay wild. We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, back down to the river. For millions of years, these mysterious creatures lived and thrived within these ancient waters. The legends of countless stories and the keepers of the river spirit. Yet in less than a century, the realm of river dragons has nearly been wiped out. The future of the Japanese giant salamander is unknown. And sadly, the probability of it becoming extinct is a very real threat due to the negative effects of human activity. If the nesting sites of these beautiful amphibians continue to be destroyed, with the building of dams and embankment protection walls, their fate is all but written in the concrete that is yet to be poured. For Okada-sensei, the fight to educate the public and protect the giants and their habitats that do still remain is never ending. Yet hope shines brightly as the work he so passionately enjoys is already being passed down and honored by his son with open arms and smiles of excitement. If you would like to make a difference in protecting the Japanese giant salamander and also dream of seeing these beautiful animals in the wild for yourself, make sure to visit the website that is helping to ensure that there is a future in the realm of river dragons. If you thought this giant salamander was fascinating, make sure to go back and watch the episode where we got its North American cousin, the Hellbender, up close for the cameras. And don't forget, subscribe and click the notification bell so you can join me and the crew on our next wild adventure.